Welcome to an edition of In a Nutshell, and this In a Nutshell is going to be talking about the medieval everyman. And I want to emphasize that this is a nutshell of a nutshell, because uh, we are talking, uh, as you will see on our next slide, this is a vast generalization. Vast. We're talking about 800 to 1,000 years over a variety of different times and places, right? You're talking about 900 in England and 1500 in Germany and 1200 in Italy and 1300 in what could be France or maybe one of those little petty dukedoms. This is a, there, there's a lot that happens in this time period. Agricultural systems, economic systems, political systems all vary greatly. What I'm going to do is just sort of scratch the surface and give you a very, very general overview, right? But I want to let you know that in a way, there's also a lot of continuity. You're talking about a time when there was not uh, massive technological change, right? There was technological change, don't get me wrong. But the way uh, crops were planted, the way crops were harvested, the way buildings were built, uh, the, we don't have a lot of technological change until we get to the end of the medieval period around the 14 to 1500s. Then there's, there's a good amount of it, but from 800 all the way up until that point, uh, especially for what we're talking about, it's generally the same. And again, we're going to be looking at not the knights, not the kings, not the barons, not the bishops, not even the priests. We're going to be looking at the common everyday person, the peasant, if you will, that lived in these times. So if we go to the next slide, I want to kind of establish what we're talking about. We're going to be talking about two different systems. Most of you have heard the feudal system, right? The feudal system is really a political system that organizes society in terms of class and in terms of who does what job, right? It works from the king down. Uh, the king is at the top. And then you have uh, the greater uh, nobility. You have the barons, uh, the main vassals, and folks like that. And then below that, you have the knights, right? The ones who actually provide military service. You have uh, some of the tradesmen. You have uh, free men and women. Uh, and when I say free, what I mean is that they own their own property. They own their own farm. That is relatively uncommon early in the period. And as we get closer to the end of the period, it has become much, much more common, and that makes a difference. And then at the very bottom, you have uh, what constitute, constitutes the greatest number of people, the serf or peasant class. They are not necessarily enslaved, but they are tied to the land. Again, generally speaking, time and place. They're tied to the land. They can't necessarily leave. They can't go somewhere else. It's very, very difficult for them to change their station, both socially and economically. So this pyramid represents, again, a very broad view of what is feudalism. It is a social and political system. But then we've got manorialism, right? Manorialism is not a social or political structure. It is, in effect, an economic structure. This is how the work that we're talking about gets done. This is the economic system. This is the go-to-work and get-it-done system of the medieval period. Uh, the people that were in, around the middle of that pyramid that I showed you, the, the, the lesser vassals, uh, the tenants-in-chief, and sometimes the knights are going to have their own parcel of land that is given to them. The land is given to them so that they can, in effect, be wealthy, they can get an income from it, and do what they need to do to serve the next higher up on the pyramid, whether that is a baron or a duke or a king. And so you see here in the middle of the, of the graphic, right over here, you've got the manor house. That is, in effect, where the big dog and his family lives, right? They don't really do the manual labor, the physical work. Their job is to provide the service going up the, the social ladder and to organize and, and run this large estate. And on the estate, you have two or three different large fields. Uh, you have pasture. You have the, 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 woo, you have the village over here where the actual serfs and peasants live in houses. Uh, you have a mill that, that processes the grain. You have a church. You have a lot of different, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the church the church is over there uh, on the other end. This is agriculture. This is what 90 plus percent of the people alive in the medieval period do across Europe. 
right? They are the lower classes. They participate in the creation of food, the management of land. And as I said, these are the ones that are tied to the land. Most of what we're talking about isn't necessarily going to be the free people. They're going to have their farm way out of town, but they're also going to have the income from it and do what they want. They may or may not owe service to someone a little further up the social ladder than them. But these lands consist of uh, two different types of property. There are the Lord's lands, or the demesne, D-E-M-E-S-N-E, which are held by the Lord himself. This is what he's going to get most of his wealth from. And so we have three fields over here. Two of them may be tilled at any one season. The other one lies fallow to let the, the, the soil sort of reinvigorate itself and gain the, the, the uh, nutrients back into it. Some of this land is going to be something that the peasants can work themselves, right? They, they will work this property Whatever they grow belongs to them. They can eat it, they can sell it if there's a surplus, things like that. But the other part of the land belongs to the Lord and the peasants have to work that land and whatever wealth arrives from that land goes to the Lord. So he's not actually having to work the land. Now, these common people, where do they live? They're going to live, as I said, in the houses. Um, this, this one is sort of a, a in between, depending upon when and what you're talking about a freehold, or a peasant's uh, living quarters. You have a, a structure. And again, let me back up and make sure everyone understands. We all love Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Peasants don't go around digging in the muck, fomenting revolution. That is a fantastic scene. I love that movie, but you got to kind of separate yourself from it. They're not all dirt poor, dressed in earth tones, and just digging in the dirt for a living. They're actually being productive. So the houses they're going to live in are going to be pretty solid because they don't belong to them. They belong to the Lord. And the Lord is thinking of his family and he's thinking of the long term, generations long. So he wants the people who live on his domain to be solid, to be stable, to be happy. So the, the houses are going to be maybe not small and comfortable, but substantial and safe. You have a fenced in area here, mostly to keep critters out than in. You have some livestock that might belong to the Lord. It might belong to the individual family. You're going to have a barn, an agricultural storage area where some of the crop may be stored, the animals may be kept. Um, the larger farm equipment is going to be kept. And you have the home. Uh, the home is going to be very simple, usually only one room. Um, and it's going to be something where people live, they eat. And we've also heard how the peasants would have the animals come in to stay warm with them. Well, Sometimes that happened and sometimes it didn't, but these farms are going to be a mix of Lord-owned and private-owned. And on the next slide, we have a modern reconstruction of what one of those may look like, just so you can see it in color. You can see what those houses may look like. They're going to be uh, maybe a stone foundation with a wattle and daub system for the walls. And of course, that thatched roof that we think is so romantic and beautiful, but it's made because the materials are cheap. This is a time period where labor is cheap and materials are expensive. So the materials, uh, you're not going to get a lead roof or a slate roof like you would on the Lord's house or as you would on church. You're going to use just grass and things that you can get for more or less free, and that's why you have these thatched roofs. Um, and on the next slide, you can see a little bit more of a cross-section of what a home is going to look like. Would the animals come and sleep with the family? Depends on how poor the family was and how far back in time we go. It is a possibility in the coldest nights of winter, yes, some of the animals may be brought inside. But a lot of these homes are going to sort of be dual purpose. You can see on one side here, it's the family area. There's a cooking hearth. There's a bed. There's some really basic furniture. This is where people are going to live. And then there's a little hallway. And then on the other side, there's a place where the animals do actually stay under the same roof, but not in the same room, in a, in a specific purpose-built room. Uh, where they're going to be able to have hay, where they're going to be able to clean it out, and things like that, right? So, again, we're talking about a primarily agricultural people. Well, what do they do, right? Uh, they farm. They do all the jobs that are necessary on a farm. Most of the agriculture in this period is going to be focused on livestock. It is going to be focused on grain production, 
wheat and rye and barley and things like that. And so what I've done is I've pulled some images that we can take a look at that kind of show you, and these are all period images, by the way, the ones I showed you before, of course, modern traditions. But I think from here on out, I have original sources from the period, the period being about five or 600 years spread, so work with me. You see here an overseer, right? And you also see another picture with an overseer sort of overseeing things. Some of the people, the people on the left, are taking care of the grain production. They're harvesting the wheat. And the people on the right are doing some digging. If any of you have ever farmed, uh, and some of you may have, you know that running a farm isn't just um, plowing and seeding and harvesting. There is a lot of work that goes into it with livestock, with repairing infrastructure, with keeping the houses up, with repairing the tools, uh, digging dikes putting up walls, breaking down walls, all this sort of thing. So it requires supervision. On a smaller manner, this may be the, the, the Lord himself. Uh, on the larger ones, he may have someone who would be in charge of, of overseeing his, uh, a reeve it would be called, uh, which is where we actually get the term sheriff. A shire reeve is a sheriff. That's neither here nor there. The reeve would oversee the production of the, the manor in particular. So... I want to show you, I couldn't get through a uh, talk about the medieval period if I didn't show you something from the Bayou Tapestry. So on the next slide, I've taken something from the Bayou Tapestry. This is along the bottom. Of course, we're not talking about battles or King Harold or anything here, but this is a classic image of agriculture going on in the time of the conquer, of the Norman conquest. And on the top, you see um, a plow. A plow to plow. The, it's a big, heavy thing, right? It's requiring two people. You have someone who is sort of operating the plow proper, and then you have someone taking care of the animals, pulling the plow to sort of turn up uh, the turf. And on the bottom, you have another animal drawing something called a harrow. A harrow is like a wooden frame that you put metal stakes in, and you drag it along the ground, and that sort of creates the nice, neat rows and everything. It kind of churns the dirt up, but in a smaller scale than a plow. And you see here someone leading the horse, pulling the harrow and someone behind throwing the seed out as uh, that goes on the fields. And this is a very, very common theme. So the Bayou Tapestry made late 12th century. And on the next slide, you see something from a little bit earlier, from about the 14th century, and lo and behold, it's almost the same image. Remember me saying that there was continuity going on? So you have here uh, a same exact thing on the top, someone handling the, the plow proper. And when you look at the plows closely, the design of them is very, very similar. You have someone sort of moving the animals along to get the plow to really dig into the earth. And on the bottom, again, you have that harrow. You have someone leading the horse, sort of pulling this over. But the person behind, this is very interesting uh, to give you a, an idea of what kind of jobs farmers had to do. This person's not scattering the seed. This person has a sling with some stones so that he can run the crows off so they don't pick the seed out of the ground and destroy the harvest. So again, another really neat insight into what kind of work they're going to have to be doing, coupled with a sense of continuity in terms of agricultural jobs and things like that. We have another image in the next slide, sort of showing the work going on in the field. And this is, this is really neat because what you start to see as the period goes on is the illustrators, mostly uh, folks in monasteries, but, but they're gonna see a lot of agriculture the work that people do tends to be the same, but you start to see the way they handle the work a little bit differently. And, and this one's interesting because you have men in a, in a variety of stages of undress, right? Not because they're just getting naked, but because they want to. But working in a field is hot, heavy work. And so you can see here some of the implements they have. You see a rake, you see a scythe, you see a flail where they're, where they're threshing the grain to separate the wheat from the chaff. And the guys on the right are basically stripped down to, in effect, their underwear, their braids, and we'll get to those in a second. So they're working in the field, they're stripped down because it's hot, heavy work. So again, don't let people tell you that the medieval period was everyone covered up and there were a lot of prudes. People are almost getting naked out in the fields because it's the way they're gonna work. Next slide sort of shows the same thing, and as time goes by, you also start to see um, men and women working in the fields together. Now, on the top image, you can see uh, another guy, you know, he's down basically to his underwear, but the other guy has the side, the hand side, and he's, he's cutting the grain, and they're, and they're separating it out. 
uh, again, showing continuity of the kind of jobs that's going to be going on over a period of several hundred years. But on the bottom, here's pictures of women helping in the fields. And we're pretty sure that women, you have only a finite amount of labor on a manor, right? So you need to take advantage of all the labor you have. The division between men's work and women's work is perhaps in this period a little bit more fluid, especially when it comes terms comes to, to agricultural work because it's muscle-based, right? It's Everything is muscle-powered in this time period except for a few exceptions like a mill or anything like that. But it's people or animals doing the work. So when it's harvest time, when it's time to do a lot of the grueling work, you're going to need as many people on hand as possible. And the next slide shows very much the same thing. You have men and women working together in the fields. On the top, you have a couple threshing the grain. Again, this is when you've harvested it. You lay it out, and you basically, the tool they have is called a flail. It's basically a, a stick with a hinge in the middle, and you just whack it, and you separate the actual wheat from the chaff, which is just the, you know, the, the grassy part that you can eat into the wheat that can eventually be ground into to flour to make bread with. Same thing on the bottom where you're starting to see a theme about the emphasis on the grain-based agriculture. Um, now, lots of pictures of agriculture, um, lots of work that we see, but I have a question to ask you on the next slide. Is it, uh, some of you may have heard of this, right? That, oh, there were, there were holy days and, and the church had arranged it so that, so that medieval people actually worked less than we do. Uh, someone had come out with a, with a study a while back that said because of all the, the, the holy days and the hol holy day holiday, you see the connection there? That the, the church would set and weddings and things like that and village festivals and carnivals that medieval people would actually only work about 150 days of the year, as opposed to modern folk who have a regular work of about 260 days a year. That is not entirely true. Uh, turns out that it's, as you can imagine, much more complicated than that. Uh, the time that they're talking about is the amount of time, not per person, but per household, that they're going to have to put towards working on the Lord's, the, 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 their, you know, their, their overseer's land, not necessarily their own, All right? So that's 150 days a year that they're working for someone else on someone else's land, right? Now this is, it's still, you have the higher ups in charge of a lot of people, but it's, it's very symbiotic. Uh, you know, the people are going to use the Lord's tools, they're going to use his plows and things like that to work their land too. It's, 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 a, it's a community. But that's the amount of time they're going to have to work on the Lord's land. That doesn't count the time they have to work on their stuff. And if any of you have ever had, you know, horses or cows or chickens or pigs, you know that you don't get a week off uh, in the middle of a festival to just not do anything. You still have animals that you have to take care of. You still have basic food uh, concerns that you have to take care of. You have to cook for yourself. You have to cook for those, your social superiors and things like that. So the medieval folks still had a lot of time to work. I don't want you to get the idea from some of these studies that medieval people got a lot of days off and that we should envy them. Uh, they received no uh, basic education whatsoever, reading and writing. They received a great deal of education in the, in the type of work they would be expected to do for most of their life, both men and women. At this point in, period, in time, uh, children weren't necessarily special and precious. They were considered tiny adults. And so as soon as they were able to start doing some of the basic work necessary to, to make things happen, they started it. So I don't want you to think that the peasants had it easy. There was a lot of work. But, but what did they do for fun? Did they do anything for fun? Well, a lot of the things they would do for fun are things that we do. They would gather together. They would have meals together. Uh, they would sing. They would dance. Uh, they would just chat it up all the time, right? This is, again, you're talking about a very close-knit community on these manors. Everyone is going to know everyone else, and they're going to know everything about everyone else. So they're either going to hate each other, or they're going to love each other. And, and you get, you know, based on what you read, you get a lot of things that all come together. Uh, but 
you know, there might be, they're not going to have even on these uh, holy days and the, and, the, and the festivals and things like that, they are going to get to participate in larger things. On the next slide, it's a very interesting slide from later in the period, almost the end of the medieval period, almost early modern, where you see a carnival going on. I think this is in a, in a German town. And when you really start looking at this photograph, you see a lot of different things. You see little theatrical productions going on on the side. You see a courtship and wooing. You see a, a, you know tables filled with pies that they're selling. You see a magic trick. Uh, you see people talking. You see people dancing. There is, there is a lot going on in this picture. And again, people from the past are very, very different. But in many ways, they're also a lot like us. They want to cut loose. They want to meet new people. Uh, they want to experience new things. They want to hear music. They want to find someone to settle down with, right? Things like that. So the things they do for fun are unfortunately not nearly as well documented as the work that they would do in the, in the fields, but we know that they did a lot of different things. Uh, and one of the things, and we also have to make sure folks realize this, we've talked about the holidays and the, and the church festivals, religion played a fantastically huge role in the life of everyone in the medieval period. And, you know, whatever your views, you have to understand, whatever your views today, you have to understand that, is that um, it, there was the Catholic Church. Now, the way the beliefs of the church were interpreted, again, varied from time and place, and there were certainly differences in different countries and different times. But more or less, this was a very unifying force, and it was a very guiding force, and it wasn't all uh, oppression. Some of the awful stuff that goes on in the medieval period from the church is, is really po politically based and not spiritually based, right? Because as powerful as the church is, it's going to play a certain role in modern politics. And this picture that I've chosen, I chose it not because it's a cathedral or it's amazing and beautiful architecture, like you think of with Notre Dame and places like that. This is uh, a still extant 12th century church in England. And it's you notice it's small, it's compact, it's not terribly big, but it is very, obviously, very well built. It's still around here with us. It is a central part of the community, and people believed in it. And how big a role did religion play in the medieval period? The only metaphor I've been able to come up with when I talk to people is sort of how we think of as electricity, right? We don't see the electrons move, but we know when we flip a switch that things happen and something's there. That's sort of, in a way, the way medieval folks felt about religion and spirituality. Here's this church. This church is a physical representation and reminder of how that plays in. So it's going to sort of set the course for their relationship with each other, for their relationship with uh, socially and politically, because the church is definitely reinforcing that pyramid that I showed you. They don't want this egalitarian, everyone's equal thing going on. Order and stability are the primary focuses of the, the grand church in this period, and these small parish churches play a huge role in that. And there are going to be people that, you know, know every everyone else. Um, now, one of the things I also want to talk to you about is uh, the reason I'm dressed up funny is because I want to show you just a little bit of the clothing and the stuff that kind of give you some three-dimensional context for what we're talking about. So let me take a, a quick jump break, and we'll come back and talk about some of the, the, the neat things to give you an idea of what the material culture of the medieval period was. Whew. Okay, everyone. Now we get to talk about some of the clothing. Um, again, many of you who have been watching for a long time are going to get tired of hearing this, but... Surprise, surprise, all these clothes are made out of natural materials, primarily and almost ex exclusively for the class we're talking about, linen and wool. Linen is a light cloth, of course, and it can kind of wick sweat away from you. And wool is a material that is natural. It breathes. It can keep you warm when it's wet. And it is very, very durable. It's the most durable material that exists in the medieval period. So that's what these clothes are going to be made of. We'll start off from top to bottom. We have this, uh, just a linen cap. A different, and by the way, most of the clothing I'm going to be showing you and talking about, this is uh, of English design and style, uh, but it's fairly the same, again, across the board, generally speaking. Vast generalizations, just please remember that. 
So, you know, head covering, most people are going to want to wear a hat or wear something on their head, especially at certain times. So they're going to have just a super plain, right, like a linen skull cap that kind of just goes over that. You see some of the period drawings, and it's just, it's just a hat. They're kind of fun. They're kind of comfortable. I'm trying to remember, I don't think I've ever seen a period illustration where they're actually tied down. They just seem to all be dangling here. I guess that was the style. Of course, we have a wool hood, and in the 14th century, it's got this long liripat tail on it that goes long. You see that tucked into people's belts? Again, I think that's very much a style thing. Um, oh, the outer garment is a wool. It is... Um, Basically a series of rectangles and triangles. Uh, the arms are big rectangles. The body is just a, uh, a rectangle. And then you have gores here, uh, triangles sewn into the seam about up to here so that it's, uh, it's wide. You can move around and things like that. Uh, underneath it, I have a white linen shirt that's pretty much the exact same pattern as the outer layer of this wool tunic. And then... Under that, I have the braise. That's the underwear, right? It's, imagine a huge baggy set of boxers with a drawstring waist and uh, points, little ties right here that you're, that you're hosing um, tie onto. And these are single leg. Notice they're not joined like a pair of pants. They're individually set. Um, and you just pull them on like a great big tall sock and you tie them up with these points. And then, of course, I have on uh, some leather shoes with hobnails. These just buckle. These are not turn shoes like I've worn before. They have a sole, but turn shoes would have also been fairly common. So that's, that's the general clothing that you're going to see. Um, everyone's going to wear a belt to kind of hang stuff onto and kind of keep the, the poofiness of the tunic up. On this, I have uh, a rosary. Again, we're talking about a very religious folks, especially in the 14th century. So this is about the time they're going to be carrying a rosary rather than wearing a cross, generally speaking. Um, have a, a knife here. Now, people think of people walking around with swords and big daggers and things like that in this time period. That's not what they did. This is more or less the exact same as a pocket knife, right? I've got two. Bring this up. I've got two parts to it. The first is, again, just a knife, right? I'm going to use this as a utility knife. I'm going to use this to cut my bread. I'm going to use this to cut my rope. Lots of different things. It's just carrying a pocket knife. That's what that is. Not meant for fighting or for self-defense. I also have, on the end, this little prick. It's called a pricker. And it's just um, um, got a handle on it, and it's just got a point. It's just a metal point. And again, you might use this to eat your food sort of as a, as a fork. No forks. Very common, at least in this time period. Uh, you might use it to make a hole in a piece of cloth or a piece of leather, but that, in effect, not to use a, a bad term, but that's the Swiss Army knife of the medieval period, right? I also have here uh, a small bag, a purse, as it were, and in here, let's see what I have in my, in my purse. It's not going to be much. I have uh, a couple of groats. That is a fortune, right, compared to uh, what some of my other compatriots have. I hope I'm not caught with that. And then I have something that can be very necessary, depending upon where I'm at and what I need to do. Flint and steel. Um, you can take this and, of course, make a fire anywhere. This is in the days before matches or lighters or anything like that. So if you need to start a fire uh, to get warm on your way or in the middle of the woods or any reason, you're going to have that, that in there. Now, one thing I want you to notice, too, about the clothing, notice how brightly colored this is, right? This is, this is red. This is blues. Um, I've got brown hosen, but they had, the green was somewhat rare, but blues, reds, and yellows were very, very common, and people liked, if they could, to dress fancy, right? They're fancy and they're practical, like this hood. So let me take this off so it doesn't get in my way. And you can sort of see... What I mean, if I pull this hood up, notice how high up it rides on my neck. This provides a great deal of warmth, but if I want to, right, if I want to cover this up to get out of the rain, I can't. And it comes way forward and it provides a lot, it keeps the wind out, 
it keeps the rain out, right? My little thing still tucked here in the back. And it's a, it's a very warm thing. But what I want to do on a warm day if I don't want to wear it the whole time? You see this. This is interesting. You can see the pattern of the hood, right? Watch this. Look at that. Isn't that goofy and dandy all at the same time? This was a very common way to wear your hood if you didn't want to wear it over your body. You could just kind of have it be a, a weird, cool hat like this. And you see a lot of illustrations, and you wonder, what is that massive stuff on their head? Well, very, very often it could be a hood. And with that hood, being that stylish, of course the lower classes are going to start this, and then the upper classes are going to go, huh, this is kind of neat. And they'll, they started to make a, a, a type of headgear that looked like this, but was not a hood, because that's what peasants wear, right? They began to make something that looked exactly like that, but it couldn't turn into a hood. Why would you need a hood? You're a, you're a lord. Um, now I want to show you this, too, as I'm taking my clothes off and getting ready for agricultural work. As I said, materials are expensive, but labor is cheap. So a lot of the tools you're going to see are going to basically save metal and not use as much metal as they can. And this shovel is a great example. You see it's wood. It's got a handle up here that I can push down. It's got a, the part right here where I can put my foot on. But notice up close, it's not metal. Of course, it's wood. It only has metal here around the very tip where I'm going to be digging in the ground. That's because you don't want to make the whole thing out of metal because that's a lot of metal. What if you could just do this? And so you see a lot of the tools from the time. Shovels, uh, rakes, scythes, um, adzes, and things like that. They're just going to have the part that actually does the work is going to be metal. The rest of it is going to be made of wood. Because this is, believe it or not, this is an incredibly expensive piece of equipment. right? Just because it's metal. Because think about how you get iron in the medieval period. You have to mine the ore, you have to get the ore, haul it somewhere, set a big fire, big enough so that it melts down and the slag comes off the top and the actual iron comes to the bottom. Then you've got to take that, take it to a blacksmith, have them heat it and hammer it down to something that can be used to make it into a shape. Wait, what are they going to heat it with? A whole bunch of firewood that the peasants have to chop over the course of a winter. Then they're actually going to start making this. Then they're going to attach it. That's a lot of labor and material that goes into something like this. So that's why it's interesting. This, this cook pot, right? You, you can imagine this is exactly the sort of thing that would hang in a, in a peasant's home to fix their food and things like that. This is incredible. This is probably one of the most expensive things that a peasant is going to own if they own it. Because you see, this is a lot of metal. Takes a lot of work to make it. Takes a lot of back work to create the iron to even make it. But it's kind of a necessity because you're going to be fixing your food that you have to eat at least a couple of times a day out of, right? So it's an investment, but it's an expensive piece of equipment. Another thing that is actually expensive, believe it or not, is a candle, right? We know what candles are. You light it and it gives off light. One of the biggest problems I have with movies that portray the past is there are candles everywhere, right? There's thousands of candles to light something up. People, candles are expensive. They take animal fat, they're a process, it's a string, the string has to be woven. After it's taken off of a plant, lots goes into making a candle, which is why the common peasant's day began with sunup and ended at sundown. They don't have the wherewithal for artificial lighting. They're going to use the sun whenever they can. And when there's no sun, especially in the wintertime, the days get shorter and they spend a lot more time indoors, sleeping, resting, maybe by the fire because that's how they stay warm. Now, what are they going to have by the fire? Again, you're talking about a very simple life. I've got a nice basic pottery mug here that I'm going to be able to drink out of. Pottery is relatively cheap. It's way cheaper than, say, metal or silver or something like that. So a peasant's going to have a lot of pottery in their house, plates, uh, cups, pitchers, things like that. And most of their um, eating ware is going to be also super basic, either pottery or 
wood, right? Wooden spoon, wooden plate. The wooden plate's gonna take a little bit more process, maybe a little more expensive, but if I drop it, it's not gonna break. It's just gonna bounce around because it's made of wood. And the, uh, you know, that's what you have to remember is that these people, their whole life is based upon what's available and what's not. When we look back at it, we tend to think the period is incredibly primitive. It is incredibly unfair to the people that lived it. It was awful. There was no medical care. Uh, they worked from sunup to sundown. How horrible. And yet, they were able to make communities. They were able to make lives. Unfortunately, we don't know much about them because I said, though they were educated in what they needed to live, they were not necessarily literate. They would not write or read. And much of what we know about them, generally speaking, is written to us or illustrated to us from someone outside their respective class, from the monasteries, uh, from accounts of, of uh, learned men who would travel into the countryside or things like that. So that, as I said, is just a gigantic bunch of material shoved into one little nutshell. It's a fascinating topic. And one series of books that I, can't, that I can recommend to you is there is a husband and wife historian team named Joseph and Francis Gies. And they were writing books in like the, the 30s and 40s and 50s. Uh, some historians don't like them because they are so broad and, and they, they take things and sort of nullify them down into, into small books. But it is a great series of books. And if you don't have them or you have access to them, I highly recommend you take a look. It's like, I call it the life in. There's life in a medieval castle, life in a medieval village, life in a medieval farm, um, you know, life on a in, a, in a medieval town. There's all these different books they've written that pull in a lot of different sources, almost as many sources as we have, and sort of refine it down and give you an idea of what life was like back then for men, women, and children that are of the common classes. Not the kings, not the knights, not the barons, not the bishops, but the regular everyday people that actually made up, as I said, about 90% of the population. It's a great story. Thank you for joining us on this History in a Nutshell. We hope you've enjoyed it. We hope you stay safe, and we can't wait to see you again at the History Center. Stay safe and take care. <laughs>